During this time, my goals are going to be to talk about the phenomenon that we may share in part with other animals, and our language and that is emotion. And also talk about some new technology, brain imaging, functional magnetic imaging. And we try to answer some very old questions about how's does motivation and emotion work. I'm going to put you with the scenario first and some of you may be familiar with. This was developed by Pavlov over a century years ago. And in this scenario, the dog presented with the sound, the dog waits. And then feeds food powder and this happened repeatedly, things start to happen in the middle of the experiment there. Interesting things start to happen here. Pavlov's study was on the salivation of the dog, the salivation increases more time to paralyzes. But other things happened here, too. You have a dog move around here more, all kinds of things are going on here. Today we're going to recount heroic tales of superhuman feats of strength, when in the face of disaster, some people are said to have summoned up incredible physical power to lift a car off of an accident victim, move giant rocks, or like Big John of Song, single-handedly hold up a collapsing beam to let the other miners escape. Are such stories true? There are many anecdotes supporting the idea but we're going to take a fact-based look at whether or not it truly is possible for an adrenaline-charged person to temporarily gain massive strength. In proper terminology, such a temporary boost of physical power would be called hysterical strength. The stories are almost always in the form of one person lifting a car off of another. In each of these cases, some aspect of leverage or buoyancy probably played some role in reducing the magnitude of the feat to something more believable. And even lifting many cars by several inches still leaves most of its weight supported by the suspension springs. But our purpose today is not to debunk any of the specific stories. For better or worse, we live in a world profoundly affected by Sigmund Freud. If I had to ask you to name a famous psychologist, the answer of most of you would be Freud. He was the most famous psychologist ever and he had a profound influence on the 20th and 21st century. Some biographical information, he was born in the 1850s. He spent most of his life in Vienna, Austria, but he died in London and he escaped to London soon after retreating there at the beginning of World War II as the Nazis began to occupy where he lived. 
He was one of the most famous scholars ever, but he was not known for any single discovery. Instead, he was known for the development of an encompassing theory of mind, one that he developed over the span of many decades. All of my research and that I conducted with my 60-plus graduate students was motivated by their need to learn so that we can teach. Of course, in some inventions happened along the way, but I've always considered the end the result. And I always consider that this invention to be byproduct, byproducts of the learning process. The end product for me was always better understanding or when one really succeeded in unifying theory that can help us in teaching the subject. I've also looked at teaching as a vehicle to try new ideas of new ways to doing things on an intelligent group of learners. That is as the vehicle for the teaching research results. And in my experience, this kind of teaching is the most stimulated and motivating to students. I am also uncovered many interesting research problems is the cause of teaching assumption. It is this unity of research and teaching their close connection and the benefits gathered by exercising and the interplay that to me characterizes the successful professor. The Earth's temperature is rising. And as it does, springtime phenomena, like the first bloom of flowers, are getting earlier and earlier. But rising temperatures aren't the only factor. Urban light pollution is also quickening the coming of spring. So temperature and light are really contributing to a double whammy of making everything earlier. Richard French Constant, an entomologist at the University of Exeter. He and his colleagues compiled 13 years of data from citizen scientists in the UK who tracked the first bud burst of four common trees. Turns out, light pollution from streetlights in cities and along roads pushed bud burst a full week earlier, way beyond what rising temperatures could achieve. This disruptive timing can ripple through the ecosystem. The caterpillars that feed on trees are trying to match the hatching of their eggs to the timing of bud burst. Because the caterpillars want to feed on the juiciest and least chemically protected leaves. And it's not just the caterpillars, of course, that are important. <laughs> 
In developing the screen and working with kids in the schools and in the classrooms, it's really helped us make the Skook something that's usable by the children themselves. They've informed us massively on how it needs to work and they've given their opinions on colors and designs. And just the feedback they've given to us has been just marvelous. It's just so enriching and it's really inspiring to actually work with these kids, particularly when you can provide them with an ability to start to playing their own music as opposed to just taking part through listening and listening to other musicians and really learning from. In today's lecture, I'm going to talk about changes in air pollution since the middle of the last century and what has created these changes. So, um, by the 1950s, air pollution was very visible with frequent thick black fogs known as smogs in many large cities around the world. But the knock-on effect is on nesting birds, which are also trying to hatch their chicks at the same time that there's the maximum number of caterpillars. So earlier buds could ultimately affect the survival of birds, and beyond. The findings are in the proceedings of the Royal Society B. The world's becoming increasingly urbanized, and light pollution is growing, which French Constant says could trick trees into budding earlier and earlier. But smarter lighting, like LEDs that dial down certain wavelengths, could help. Perhaps the exciting thing is. If we understand more about how light affects this bud burst, we might be able to devise smarter sort of street lighting that has less red components, and therefore less early bud burst. Thus keeping springtime an actual springtime phenomenon. In 1943, what became known as the Green Revolution began when Mexico, unable to feed its growing population, shouted for help. Within a few years, the Ford and Rockefeller Foundations founded the International Rice Research Institute in Asia, and by 1962, a new strain of rice called IR-8 was feeding people all over the world. IR-8 was the first really big modified crop to make a real impact on world hunger. In 1962, the technology did not yet exist to directly manipulate the genes of plants. And so IR-8 was created by carefully crossing existing varieties, selecting the best from each generation, further modifying them, and finally finding the best. Here is the power of modified crops, IR-8, with no fertilizer, straight out of the box, produced five times the yield of traditional rice varieties. In optimal conditions with nitrogen, it produced 10 times the yield of traditional varieties. 
By 1980, IR-36 resisted pests and grew fast enough to allow two crops a year instead of just one, doubling the yield. And by 1990, using more advanced genetic manipulation techniques, IR-72 was outperforming even IR-36. The Green Revolution saw worldwide crop yields explode from 1960 through 2000. So, when we talk about the polar regions, just to clarify exactly what we mean. And we have first of all the Arctic at the top of the Earth and the Antarctic at the bottom, and so the Arctic was named after the Greek word for bear. Now surprisingly, it's not after the polar bears that live in the Antarctic or live in the Arctic and based on it's after the little and great bear constellations that can be seen in the sky. Now the Greek also hypothesized that there would be the Antarctic which is how we get the name Antarctica, and of course it wasn't discovered until much later on. Now these regions are opposite in many ways other than just their names and their location on the globe, and so if we look at the Arctic first of all, and the Arctic is actually ocean surrounded by land, and so you can see here this is the UK down here and this kind of Russia, and then American Canada around here, and so there is a bit of land cover in our ice on the top in the Arctic, which is Greenland here and may see all this area here. Surprisingly a lot of people don't realize that this isn't actually land. The North Pole isn't on land. It's just one big ocean. I have said before that you can't have a civilization that doesn't have art. When we think about the great civilizations historically, all of them had great production of culture and art, because a society has to be able to observe itself. And the sophistication of the great civilizations were their ability to look at themselves and what allows a society to do that. Are the producers of art and culture mirror back to the core of the society? Exactly what is being produced at that moment. How people are thinking of themselves and how individuals are relating to the social structure at that time. Art is the vehicle through which we understand that. Were you to take away art? What would be that mirror? How would we see what we are about? How would we understand what was going on in Paris at the time of the Impressionists when people were learning to see in a completely different way? pre cinematograph appear all of these things are just emerging and here are people looking at the world in a very different way, which was considered so radical at the time. <laughs> 
there is a picture, sort of artist's impression, before the space age of what Venus might be like on its surface, and so this was looking at the planet Venus, it was science fiction and science fact all the way up to 56 before the start of the space age, but it wasn't completely disproved, this idea of a really sort of ush environment on Venus until 1967, which is when the first measurements in detail were done at Venus. So Mariner 4 and Mariner 5 confirmed the feeling from an earlier space mission that in fact the surface of Venus was not like this at all, but extremely hot and and also that the clouds were made of sulfuric acid so there wasn't a nice water cycle like is going on in this picture and so, that it had to wait for these in situ measurements by spacecraft to actually do that and so Venus turned out not to be quite as Earth-like as we thought and I'll sort of tell you about some of the latest results from Venus Express, which, which they actually there are some Earth-like features, but to a large extent, it's not like the Earth. Okay, so a brief comparison between. This is a kind of object that you're probably all familiar with when you had the term robot, but I'm going to show you the very, very first robots. These were the very first robots. They were characters in a play in the 1920s called Rossum's Universal Robots and they, the play was written by Czech writer called Karel Kapik. And basically, these robots, you know, people tend to think of robots as kind of cute cuddly toys or, you know, Hollywood depictions kind of devoid of politics. But the first robots were actually created and imagined in a time of absolute political turmoil. You just had the First World War, you know, it finished had a devastating impact across Europe and so people will kind and people are kind of reflecting on what does it mean to be human, what makes us human, those kinds of question. And this kind of context is what inspired Capic to kind of write this play. And interestingly, these robots being human, they are actually in the play assembled on a production line, a bit like the Ford manufacturing production line. So even though they are human, they are assembled and these robots are designed to labor. And that is their primary purpose in society, 